Turkey case in terms of human rights violations in general and the situation in Turkish jails under the influence of COVID threat and violations of the rights of the political prisoners in those jails in particular. We have four great speakers, Katrina Alantas, Joyce Davis, Kiran Nezish and Talib Aydın. Katrina Lantas is the chair of Lantas Foundation and thank you for being with us today, Katrina. And we will start with you. And I have a question. I'm sure that you have lots of things to talk about, but my first question to lead the discussion would be that, as you may all know that Turkey has ranked the 107th in the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. And concerning this, I would like to ask you what you think about the ongoing situation in Turkey in terms of democracy and human rights regarding the shift from democracy to dictatorship. Is there anything that can be done for the situation here in the United States and in other countries, maybe in the context of political powers, governments, human rights organizations? I know you follow closely. It's a harsh violation to incarcerate pregnant women and women in postpartum period in particular. I would like to ask if you have a plan to work on specifically this issue. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. And I'm very honored to be on this panel with you, Hassan, with such distinguished colleagues. Um, and before I respond to your question, which is a very important one and make some remarks, I want to acknowledge the moment in which we are gathering to talk about the horrible human rights abuses in Turkey. Um, here in the United States, we are finding ourselves as well in a moment of great tension and great concern and, uh, and awakening in some senses, if you will, to some of the ways, some of the very profound ways in which our own nation has fallen short of its very highest ideals. You know, my late father, um, Tom Lantos, as some of your listeners may know, was the only survivor of the Holocaust ever elected to serve in the United States Congress. And during his nearly 30 years of service in Congress, he made human rights the key focus of his entire really <laughs> congressional career. Because having experienced himself what it meant when the world was deaf and blind to the inhumanity and injustice that his people were enduring, he sort of made it his mission in life to never turn a blind eye. And he used to speak about something that he called the hypocrisy gap. And to him, the hypocrisy gap was the gap between the very ennobling and very wonderful ideals enunciated at the founding of our nation and the many ways in which, of course, we fell short, um, the most obvious being our nation's original sin of slavery. But my father was nonetheless very optimistic because he said each generation of Americans has worked to close bit by bit, piece by piece, fight by fight that hypocrisy gap. And right now, we are, as I say, facing a moment of reckoning here in the United States where our hypocrisy on issues of systemic racism and um, equal justice under the law are being brought front and center for us to confront. And to me, as somebody who's involved in human rights, this is really critically important because the United States has sought to be, and in fact has been a voice for advancing human rights globally and advocating for human rights globally, in part because we, we have had credibility in the world, because people have viewed us as a society willing to tackle these difficult issues, willing, I hope, to face our own shortcomings, and I hope, humble enough to acknowledge them. So I just want to offer that because this is the moment that we're in, and I think it's important for the United States to do much, much better than we've done in sort of living up to the measure of our ideals precisely so that we can advocate on behalf of people living in truly authoritarian societies. And one of the key things that I think all of us who care about Turkey, Turkey is a great country with an extraordinary civilization 
and a remarkable history. It is all those things. Turkey really is one of the great civilizations of the world. And we see this great country and this great civilization being dragged away from democracy, away from rule of law, away from pluralism, away from the recognition of the importance of the separation of mosque and state and building a secular society in which all people, all faiths, people of every faith and people of no faith have a safe and a respected and a, a welcome place sort of at the communal table. Turkey is turning into something very different under the autocratic rule of, uh, of Erdogan. And we have seen a shocking degradation of rule of law, a shocking degradation of democracy and pluralism. Turkey has more journalists imprisoned in its prisons than any other country in the world. That is a badge of shame. Turkey has got thousands of women and their babies and their children imprisoned presently for the grave crime of being linked to a peaceful faith community, the Gulenists. Um, Turkey, as we know, there was an attempted coup in 2016. And that is never a good thing. And a coup is always something that any government has the right to resist. But what we have seen in the aftermath of that is, again, the Erdogan government using this failed and, and you know, th there are questions surrounding many of the allegations about the coup to begin with, but using that as a pretext for a brutal crackdown and purging of everyone that has been perceived as one of his enemies. So we know, we know these facts. And now, as the world is grappling with the coronavirus pandemic, with COVID-19, we see it sort of is laying bare the extent to which and the degree to which um, so much of what has unfolded in Turkey has been little more than a pretext for Erdogan to crush those who he views as a threat to his increasingly authoritarian power. So the Turkish parliament, as many of your viewers will know, and certainly my colleagues here, um, has passed a law to provide for the release of tens of thousands of prisoners due to the risk of the spread of COVID in the close and not sanitary conditions of prison. But who is being exempted from this public health measure? Who will not be released? Real criminals, people who have committed serious crimes, violent crimes, actual violations of Turkish criminal codes are being released. Some of them temporarily, some of them permanently. But entirely peaceful prisoners of conscience, those targeted for daring to be part of the Gulen movement, for daring to call out for pluralism, for daring to be bona fide a journalist reporting on the degradation of democracy in Turkey, they will not be released under this sort of uh, public health um, uh, measure being taken. So the situation is very, very grave. I wanna end my opening remarks before I address your question with what I do consider to be um, more than a glimmer of hope for democracy in Turkey. And that is the result almost exactly a year ago in June of 2019 of the mayoral election in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. So in what can only be seen as a stunning rebuke to Erdogan and to the, the group of thugs around him who really have taken control of this great country, um, the opposition candidate, um, and I, I have uh, Ekrem Imamoglu, won a decisive victory. It's, you know, it's a good example of the old adage, be careful what you pray for because you may get it. In the first round of the election, which again, we know was very close, but the opposition narrowly won it. Erdogan didn't like that result. He didn't want the opposition to win. And so really they bent the rules and twisted things around in order to hold a second election, confident that with their 
um, stranglehold on the media and intimidation of opposition forces that they could once again keep the crown jewel, the mayoralty of uh, Istanbul in, uh, in um, Erdogan's party's hands. But as we know, in that second round, um, Imamoglu won a decisive victory. And I think he said at the time, and I, I sort of want to quote him, he said to the voters of Istanbul, you have protected the reputation of democracy in Turkey. And so on a, on a more hopeful note, because I know I've said some things that are obviously very disturbing, um, there, there are signs that democracy is not dead in Turkey. And, and if the Turkish people have the opportunity um, to vote freely, they are now beginning to show that, that Erdogan's days of uh, autocratic rule, I believe, are numbered. Now, finally, as to your question, um, Hafsa, I think that we have not had anywhere near the sort of aggressive posture in our foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan that we need to have. Um, the United States is obviously still, you know, the most powerful country in the world. Turkey very much needs and wants to maintain good relations with the United States. Um, Turkey needs to maintain good relations with Europe um, and, and with other players in the world because in addition to all of the human rights abuses and democratic abuses and abuses of rule of law, Turkey's economy is in very, very dire um, shape. And so there are leverage points where there is uh, leverage that can be brought to bear on Turkey. I was disappointed when Pastor Brunson was released, um, which was something we welcomed and something I spoke out about and that was long overdue. But I was disappointed that there wasn't more of an effort at that time to call on Turkey to release prisoners, political prisoners of conscience within Turkey. Um, it's a wonderful thing when one American who's being unjustly uh, imprisoned is released. But, but you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's very, you know, uh, related to your point that uh, just in a two days time, Metin Topu, the U.S. consulate employee in Istanbul, was arrested and sentenced to almost nine years imprisonment. What do you think about that? It's kind of, a, you know, using this position as a leverage in the diplomatic relationship between two countries, you know, as political hostages? Yes. What's your mark on this issue? Well, it, it is using people as political hostages, but the bottom line is that there has not been a sufficient focus on the massive human rights abuses taking place in Turkey. Leadership has to start at the top. I would like to hear the president speak out about this. Um, Secretary of State Pompeo has addressed it, but again, we need to be more aggressive and there are levers that can be used. We also have, um, as you know, the, uh, the Global Magnitsky Act, which allows our government to place pretty biting economic and travel sanctions on individuals from other countries who are implicated in serious human rights abuses. If we take a close look at Turkey, if we start identifying the leadership within the government that are implicated in these massive abuses of human rights and putting Magnitsky sanctions on them, that's something that's going to get some attention in Turkey. So I should stop there. I don't want to take time away from your other wonderful guests, and we'll have an opportunity for dialogue and discourse later. But, uh, but as I say, Turkey is one of the great nations of the world, and Turkish civilization has contributed massively to the richness of our world civilization and culture. And it is, it breaks my heart to see what is happening in this great country, this country that modeled for so many years for the world that democracy could, could take place and could thrive and secularism could thrive in a, an overwhelming majority Muslim country. It was a powerful example in that regard, a member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and it has retreated and gone in the wrong direction and we need to bring Turkey back to what it must be for the sake of the whole world. Thank you, Katrina. It was a very concise and to the point remark to the issue. 
And I would like to go on with Joyce, Joyce Davis. She is the chair of World Affairs Council in Harrisburg, and she's also a great journalist. As a human rights activist and a journalist, I would like to hear your perspective in, on that issue. As an ally, as Katrina mentioned, of the USA, Turkey is carrying out a huge persecution and violating hundreds of thousands of people's rights in front of the world's eyes. I know that you are deeply concerned about the issue. You have been organizing panels. One of, in one of them, I was a speaker, and you're raising awareness. In this regard, I want to ask about your work so that it could be an example practice for many of us, or maybe your future plans in terms of taking action and your suggestions as to speaking up. Right. Well, thank you again for inviting me to speak, and and uh, thank you to all of the other uh, panelists who are also uh, sharing their views. Listen, Turkey became very, very dear to me. I visited there many, many times, and actually, as president of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg, we had planned we uh, yearly uh, trips, uh, educational trips. We also had been participating in training teachers in our area, sending teaching delegations to Turkey. Um, so we were really felt that this was going to be, we we're gonna have a very close relationship. Unfortunately, um, that that had to be put to an end with the um, ascension of Erdogan in, into office. Uh, we have had to warn people to stay away from Turkey. We have, as you can see, even now with someone in the consulate, uh, basically being arrested how dangerous it is for uh, for any American, you know, to go that could easily be considered a, a political <laughs> uh, opposition or something based on, on absolutely nothing. But I'll tell you, as a journalist, because I am a, a also opinion editor for Penn Live, which is the major news organization in, in the capital of Pennsylvania. So I handle op-eds, I handle editorials, and that is a forum. I, I would urge people to send me your writings. Let me know this is an outlet for you to be able to express opinions. And, and I do welcome them, and they will be public. Um, I also, as president of the World Affairs Council, and of, of course you may know the World Affairs Councils of America is a national organization. It is, um, we have at least um, 90 to 100 World Affairs Councils around the country in different cities. Big ones like uh, Los Angeles and like Philadelphia and other ones, small ones like, like ours, but that are strategically located in capitals so that we can get the attention of lawmakers. And I will say that the Red Rose uh, Society here, which was very much uh, promoting um, the highest values of, of peaceful coexistence in our region and representing Turkey, I mean, it was a beloved organization, really connected to lawmakers and really had influence. All of that we see has just basically ground to a halt. The impression that many people now have of a country that was once on the verge of, of, of democracy, even of possibly entering the EU, now is seen as a despotic, dangerous place to visit. Now that's horrible. At the same time, I remember before Erdogan stepped into office, I had um, contacted one of the most prestigious journalism institutes in the country, the Poynter Institute. And they had begun a collaboration to work with Turkish journalists, to give them uh, training, to have them have connection to US uh, news organizations. I fear that the journalists they were working with are now in prison. Mm -hmm. And so my heart is crushed. I am absolutely crushed because all of the effort that I thought we were going to make to bring a free press to Turkey mm -hmm. is, is, is gone. I'm also heartbroken because Hafsa, when you spoke to us, I can't tell you the tears I saw in the audience and the people that came to me afterwards about women and children in prison, about pregnant women. This is just, look, this is just not acceptable in society. And you know what we're going through here in the United States. Yes, we have a system of racism, but if my people, the African-American people knew what was going on in Turkey, they would stand solidly with you. And that's why my job is to educate people, to let people know what is going on, to let them know of the human suffering so that you have a powerful voice in this country as well. So what's my role with the media, with my organization? To blare it out, to let the world know, to let Americans know 
we cannot stand by silently while this kind of suffering is going on in the world. And I will tell you the great disappointment I have that our national government, our White House, no longer sees human rights as a priority. Uh, I don't know how our country got to this point <laughs> that we are basing our relationship with other countries on America first, on not caring about what's going on with, with vulnerable people, not caring about promotion of democracy, not caring about the rule of law. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of heartbreak in our own country as well. But the hope is that once we can write all of this in our country, we can begin re-engaging with the world, uh, taking a look at our friends and trying to have a positive impact. I can tell you that a different administration in the White House is going to see the relationship with Turkey a whole lot different. They are mm -hmm. not going to turn a blind eye to what we see going on in prison. They are not going to turn a blind eye to teachers, to journalists being in prison because they say something against the government. Mm -hmm. So my only hope for you is this, times will change. But right now, in the midst of the darkest hour, because I think that's where we are with Turkey, you have friends, you have people who are standing with you. And anything that we can do to help at least get the truth out in the world, we will do. Thank you. We hope so too, Joris. And as you mentioned this in this term, solidarity is very important in terms of speaking up together, standing against the main activities together. It's very important and we are with you too in this country. And I would like to ask the same question that we discussed with Katrina. What do you observe about the COVID threat in Turkey's jails, given the increasing number of cases and the situation of political prisoners whose lives are disrespected? Well, see, in this country also, I remember we ran many editorials and all about prisons in our own country, about releasing people who are not criminals, who are not violent criminals. Uh, letting, because here's why. It is only common sense. It is public health. If you have conditions in the prison that are so horrendous as the ones I have heard described with 45 people in a cell that can only hold seven, with sick people, who have uh, heart conditions or who have other conditions being exposed to the virus, keeping people together. When that virus spreads inside the prison, it doesn't stay there. There are workers who come in and who go out back into their communities. They are carrying that virus back into society. It is just ludicrous. It's nonsense. It is, it's, it's just foolhardy you are risking infecting the whole population by not dealing with it inside the prison. Um, and that is what we came to realize in our own country, that if we were going to try to keep the general population safe, we could not have a place where that virus was spreading. And we all know in any prison, the situation is not hygiene. There isn't enough soap. There isn't enough uh, running water. And, and what we have seen in Turkish prisons, they're not giving enough food. People are not being given adequate help. Oh my goodness, the story that I saw of the man who had diabetes and had his leg amputated and then put back into a cell with other people who had COVID-19, who had the coronavirus, that is immoral. And so I, I, I have to lend my voice to those who speak to, to the government of Turkey with all humaneness, you must address this issue. This is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. It's an issue of decency and of morality. If you are a moral government, if you have any shred of decency, you will address this, you will take care of those vulnerable people, and you will not risk infecting your entire population by this foolhardy policy that you're pursuing right now. Yeah. Thank you so much for these important remarks, Joris. We are gonna go back to conversation again. Right. Now I'm gonna continue with Kiran, Kiran Nazish. Thank you, Kiran, for being here with us today. And while talking about oppression and human rights violations, one of the most signif significant issues is the freedom of expression, of course, and the situation of media. There are hundreds of jail journals in Turkey who are allegedly accused of terrorism. And as the co-founder of the Coalition of Women in Journalism, Kiran, what do you think about this issue? Turkey is the top jailer of journalists in the world. 
Talking about Müesser Yıldız who was recently arrested. Ayşenur Parıldağ, Hanım Büşra Erdal, Hatice Duman, Hülya Kılınç and once arrested but then released Zehra Doğan. Journalists from different segments of the society with different ideas, with different beliefs, they are incarcerated. What do you think? So first of all, thank you for having me, Hafsa. I really appreciate it. Uh, for some reason, uh, my meeting is saying that I should leave. Okay, got it. There was an error on my computer. Thank you. And and I, I, I really appreciate everyone over here, um, you know, with their views and the work that all of you are doing, which is very important. Um, first of all, I, I want to describe a little bit about what happened to press freedom in Turkey and why we are here where journalists are in prison in really bad situation especially in the most current situation, as you know, with the COVID-19, uh, how journalists are still in prison. And they're the ones I know that uh, some of you spoke about this already, about how uh, prisoners are being released, but human rights defenders and journalists are still kept in prison. And so why did Turkey really come here? I myself, just a little bit, not to take too much of your time, but briefly, um, I've been based as a journalist in Turkey for five years, I was. Um, and mostly I was covering, you know, I, I, was, I was a war correspondent, so I was covering the Syria border and then before that I was in Iraq, but I happened to be in Turkey and uh, it was astonishing for me to notice how um, foreign correspondents like me had to mediate how we worked in that country. There were certain, there have been for many, many years in under Erdogan's government that we, ha we could not go into certain territories of reporting. And that is something that was accepted in foreign correspondence circle in the foreign press, that you could not cover the Kurdish issue, or if you were to cover the Kurdish issue, you were going to do it with a certain angle. You could not go to certain places like the Southeast. If you did, you were followed by the government. Uh, you would get a call from somebody. You would lose your press card. So there are certain understandings that journalists in Turkey, even the foreign correspondents, are have always had working in that country that there are certain no-go areas right and those are these issues that the government doesn't like usually with the opposition and from that sort of erasing the kurdish coverage in turkey uh, slowly we saw that um the government moved towards other areas as well like you could then if you were to cover jhp for example opposition of any kind opposition of Erdogan, you were to minimize that coverage. And this was an understanding that foreign correspondents usually had. And if we wanted to investigate, we knew that we had to have a bucket list, investigate and leave. This is how foreign press has been working for a long time. So when this, ha this kind of environment exists in any country, um, it becomes an understanding for the press that you have to compromise on on do, covering issues in a country, which means we're giving in a way, we're allowing certain kind of leverage to uh, a government that is rather oppressive in certain ways, which has been the Erdogan's government. And I think this kind of culture kind of led to what we see today in Turkey, where journalists are local journalists, Turkish journalists, Kurdish journalists are in prison and we don't see much opposition or real conversation you know in a democratic setting where parliamentarians or uh, um, politicians are supposed to bring these issues as human rights issues i mean how would they when most of them themselves are in prison as we know that uh, a lot of kurdish politicians are in prison as well so i think that in the environment in turkey has been such that we have accepted that there is a press freedom issue and some of some people talk about it human rights organizations talk about it um but i think we have come to a point where it's really uh, it's become a culture that is is hard to uh change at this point and i feel like right now with the covid 19 as you know you've shared some of those details you guys have published statements and recommendations as well um, it's astonishing to see that so many prisoners are being released in Turkey, a lot of them with criminal record and human rights defenders are not. Um, and also that, you know, uh, what, what kind, what lawyers can do for journalists who are in prison right now is really uh, minimal. So I wanted to share a little bit about um, 
some of the work, uh, you know, we did, I wanted to highlight some of the cases. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to read it um, off um, so that I don't miss any of the accurate details. Um, so if you were to look at Turkey in prison, as you know that, um, so I, I'm a founding director of the Coalition for Women in Journalism, and we're a support organization for women journalists um, around the world. And last year, Turkey became one of the top countries where we were documenting cases of women journalists being in prison. Of course, Turkey is also the country where most journalists are in prison currently. This, this, uh, so Turkey is above Saudi Arabia, which is known for human rights abuses and uh, you know, uh, bad record on press freedom, as well as Iran, both of these countries. Turkey, in Turkey, you have more journalists who are in prison. And so last year, Turkey became the top country where we saw women reporters were in prison. And that is one of the reasons we started looking at prisons itself around the world, because we were astonished by how women journalists were being treated. Um, in Turkey, and then the, ca the, the, the cases that we, we were hearing from inside of prisons. So if we were to just look at 2020, uh, between January and April, this is only the first uh, four months, uh, we had about 18 cases that were filed against women reporters. This is in spite of the fact that there were many women reporters already in prison. And more than 25 women journalists were tried in these cases. Uh, 12 of them were accused of terrorism related charges um, and that these journalists were essentially all of these terrorism related charges were against journalists were simply doing their job. They were part of left uh, leftist media organizations um, and uh, nine of these women journalists were dismissed from their newspapers as well. One of them was Hurriyet newspaper without any explanation and we see that the trend that government um, accusing journalists of terrorism for doing their job, imprisoning them, taking them into prisons, arresting them, detaining them, raiding their homes. We see that that trend kind of trickles down and becomes part of the industry as well. And we see that under pressure, news organizations in Turkey have also, um, without any explanation, fired journalists or limited the capacity of the work that they do. Uh, we've heard from in numerous cases, uh, because we look at women journalists only, um, we, we have heard from many women journalists that they are told by the editors to moderate their coverage or to tone down their coverage as well. Um, four women reporters were charged of insulting or identifying a public officer, businessman as a target. And usually when you investigate these cases a little bit, you find that it's usually because they're on the opposite side, they're saying something in opposition to the government or covering something like that. Um, I do also want to say that in the last five, five six years, I, I don't think that in Turkey, journalists are really able to cover um, the government anyway, um, both foreign journalists as well as local journalists. So when you hear newspapers or news organizations trying to censor what they're already not covering, that becomes really kind of a blackout of what, can, what kind of country Turkey is anymore or what the government is doing. It's sort of, it's kind of a blackout on uh, what kind of democracy Turkey is if journalists are unable to cover what the government is doing, right? Um, um, just br briefly, I wanted to go through a few other attacks that I think that the trickle down of what the government is doing comes back, comes into society and news organizations. Three reporters, um, two of them were women, were subjected to physical attacks um, after their coverage. Uh, one woman journalist was detained with, pol uh, with a police raid because of her news article about COVID-19. This is very recent. Um, 10 women journalists trials were adjourned until April 30th. There's a lot of derailing, as you see, if you look at the legal system, key, cases keep on getting derailed, derailed. And while that is going on, uh, oftentimes journalists are kept in prisons, not outside of prison. And this is also happening during COVID-19. Um, and, and then, um, let's see. There was a journalist recently uh, who was taken to prison actually just two days ago. Um, I think you mentioned her name, uh, Maya Sir Yildiz. She's 57 years old. She, uh, she is still has to go through the whole legal process, but she's just kept in prison. Um, she's really old, you know, uh, she cannot really survive that kind of environment. Uh, the sentence, they, the, the, what they're 
uh, prosecuting her for is because uh, is that she was uh, reporting on an, uh, with an opposition media. So the situation in Turkey is like I think that um, I do want to point out yes these are happening. Uh, there are new cases every day. We see that there are abuses against media organizations as well as journalists and. At the end of the day, if the media industry, the press in Turkey has to survive, they have to see, I, I have these conversations with newsrooms in Turkey all the time. And when I talk to them, they always, you know, really good publications, Jamhuria, T24, people who are by net, these organizations that are striving to do good journalism in Turkey and continue to, to keep the press alive. It's a struggle for them because they do know that if they have to keep uh, keep the sh uh, keep the show running. They need to compromise in certain ways, and slowly that compromise is turning into um, silencing of issues in Turkey, especially when it comes to accountability of the of the sitting government in Turkey. So I just want to say one thing that I I noticed that we want to do as well, and we try to do is is to bring politicians and parliamentarians who are in the opposition or colleagues, um, people who are still interested in in, in um, keeping the press uh, and human rights alive in Turkey, in, in, in Turkish democracy to, to everyone should collaborate and parliamentarians and politicians especially should bring these issues and take them seriously and bring them in the parliament, uh, even if they're in the opposition. I think it's very important to keep, you know, press freedom, alive in a democratic country and i think that is the job of parliamentarians and politicians to keep the conversation going and and challenge the government for um, these actions thank you so much you summarize the situation very vividly kiran and in the light of the things that you said i want to emphasize the ironic situation uh, i don't know if you could follow the news about I can't remember his name. He's the he's from the Minister of Justice. I think the Vice, you know, Minister, and he said that okay, there are no death cases in jails, COVID cases, but I don't say there are not cases. It's a complicated, you know, situation. situation. And isn't it ironic that the you know the, as a top jailer of the journalist Turkey. We, can't, we cannot get a true, a correct access to the information because freedom of expression, the media is silenced and we don't know how many cases, not only in jails, but also in the country. We don't have the access. Would you like to highlight anything about that, Kiran? Sure. Um, if I were to, I mean, I think that one good way of going into this, it would be to to tell you what we have been hearing from some of the lawyers of the journalists. So, so during this, of course, the, when the COVID broke and a, a lot of us, um, like some of you mentioned that, you know, we were talking about prisoners because prisoners are in a situation, they're, uh, they're kind of in closed boundaries and they're, they need to be kept safely or released so that they're safe. So this conversation kind of came about and we started looking at what is happening in the prisons in Turkey. And we spoke to some lawyers um, from that time until recently as well. And I, I do want to say that one, that Turkey is very much Turkish authorities, police and uh, manage, uh, administrators in prisons are very aware of the risks of COVID-19 inside of prisons. They are, we know that is true, A, because they're releasing a lot of, you know, uh, criminals. B, that we also see that, um, I think it was 12 hours. Yeah, I have, I have some notes in here. Um, the administrators, our managers of prisons, they, were, they don't work full time anymore. They're working on shifts. So they have restructured the system of prison and who, who gets to be part um, of the administration of prison. Uh, be, after going through this careful process of keeping everyone safe. So if you're working in the prison, you are, you have gone through a procedure where you're doing 12 hour shift, which means that um, if uh, the kind of issues that this has brought in for journalists specifically or any kind of prisoners who are there is A, that there is more uh, isolation. So, uh, so people who were in prison, human rights defenders and journalists, especially who we know were part of prisons in, in large numbers in a large room kind of uh, situation, they're now put in isolated prisons. Uh, we know that we, we have gotten this information from many prisons in Turkey. We were following only women journalists, but these are placed in North and South Turkey. And we've gotten this from almost everywhere that 
all of these journalists are put into social isolation, mm -hmm. uh, into isolated prisons for the purpose of social isolation. However, we think that this is also just to, you know, limit them and uh, it's completely unempathetic and immoral to do that. Um, I do also want to point out that some of these journalists and human rights defenders are not have not already been persecuted. Some of them are just waiting trials. So while they're waiting trials, the government should release them, right? The court should re release them on humanitarian uh, grounds, but they don't do that. They put them in prison. That includes Mayasar Yildiz, who has not gone through the whole illegal oh process. Gosh. She's waiting trial. Um, and she she's 57 years old and she's put into prison. If I were to go through some, some things, I think, um, um, okay, so the kind of complication that this can, um, this can have while COVID-19 is going on, um, the duties of managers of prisons is compromised and limited. Um, so this can do all kinds of things. It's causing problems for lawyers as well to access their um, the cases that they're um, doing, working on, um, they don't have access. So there are certain things that we heard from lawyers and I'm just gonna narrate them. Um, it takes, a, it used to take a few hours to correspond with a, with a prisoner, say. Say if it's a journalist or a human rights defender. Now it takes more than two days to even do any kind of correspondence because the prisons are regulated much more, right? Um, you don't have the duty staff in prisons. Confidential material is not confidential anymore because a lot of the women journalist prisoners are telling us through their lawyers that their, uh, their material that they want to share with their lawyer, which is supposed to be confidential, is now read by the managers, um, the administration of the prison. Um, the single prison cell isolation is a big issue. It's causing a lot of depression. And uh, one uh, prisoner also told us that um, she was going through PTSD and was having panic attacks. And that is obviously understandable um using covid as an excuse um so a lot of a lot of time a lot of the lawyers and prisoners are also saying that you know obviously we have had this conversation before but using covid19 as an excuse to put them on further isolation so these are, i think that these are obviously uh we see that this is blatantly trying to put more pressure on human rights defenders and um, and journalists. Um, and I think that the government or the courts might be doing this um, deliberately so that they can use this as an opportunity to oppress more um, and stifle any, any kind of conversation that has to happen. I do want to mention one thing is that I have, as a journalist, as well as, you know, when we started the coalition, I've followed many court cases and been there and followed court cases both uh, for of journalists but also for sometimes like we did a uh, Kurdish students and I was present in, in these courts and I think after the coup attempt something that drastically changed that I noticed which I had a problem with was that the the judges and the jury is usually very um they're they're young and inexperienced and they seem to be very blatantly pro government pro-party, if I were to say pro Erdogan. And, and you would see that very, very vividly when you're, when you're seeing the court proceedings. So when during this process, there isn't much that a, a, anyone in opposition or a press freedom defender, a human rights defender could do in a courtroom because a judge himself is biased. And that is something that I think that we haven't seen much uh, of a conversation about and I think that's probably because we don't see much investigations on these things in Turkey. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you so much for this valuable information. And our last speaker is uh, Talip Aydın, former head of the Human Rights Department in Turkey. Uh, Talip Bey, Turkey has never been on a good level in terms of ensuring human rights. But lately, I mean, since the failed coup attempt in 2016, violations have accelerated. Coming from the field, how can you elaborate the situation in terms of democracy, human rights, touching on the extent and the types of the violations? Uh, thank you. Uh, especially uh, the corruption case uh, in 2013 was a starting point, a uh, kind of motivation for the uh, Erdogan regime. Uh, and then uh, the Gulen movement, especially, 
uh, targeted with that uh, uh, case. And the corruption after the corruption case, and that group uh, was specifically targeted and uh, a kind of demonization process has started. I mean, uh, I would like to underline the psychological uh, background and uh, what ha has happened uh, since the 2013 and uh, between the coup attempt. And uh, as we know that uh, the most atrocity crimes like the genocide and crime against humanity uh, are not uh, effectively impossible to perpetrate against the victims uh, that appear uh, uh, as human. So uh, we, we have witnessed a, a mass atrocity uh, fostering period uh, for the last five years. And uh, as we know, unfortunately, and Erdogan regime has captured all uh, the uh, important uh, segments of the um, institutions. I mean, there is no judiciary and independent judiciary. There is no uh, uh, free media. So uh, classical uh, authoritarian regime uh, exists there. And then uh, Erdogan's uh, propaganda machine has started uh, uh, working and uh, dehumanizing, scapegoating, demonizing, profiling the especially Dylan Moon's followers have became the daily routine uh, for the part of regime mouthpiece of the media. So it was deliberate because they were repeating the same argument again and again. And they, they, they are deliberately preparing the people uh, to the, uh, the, the later uh, issues. And so uh, during that time, uh, we saw uh, the, the movement supporters have been accused for everything. I mean, uh, like the, uh, they, they are the puppet of the international actors such as Vatican, uh, you know, United States, European Union, Israel, and uh, ISIS. Uh, it's not necessary to be logical or uh, uh, just just uh, the repeat the same argument again and again. And the the supporter of the Erdogan is ready has was ready to buy it. Uh, of course, then uh, the, that uh, uh, situation uh, ended with uh, uh, the mass atrocity crimes, which uh, we can term persecution, crime against humanity, and the genocide. And the seed uh, of the hate, masterfully planted, carefully fostered by the Erdogan propaganda machine, has soon uh, turned into the atrocities and tragedies. And uh, the, the, we, were, we are now wondering how the normal uh, people are accepting that situation. I mean, how they, uh, how they, uh, they don't reject the, uh, the, that type of human rights violations. Uh, the, the reason for that, that type of the propaganda, they, their mindset has been changed by the government and they see the, 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 the followers of the Gulen movements uh, less human. And according to them, they, are, they, are, uh, they, don't, they, they don't deserve to be named as human. And it's, it's very uh, interesting, very sad uh, to say that. So uh, especially uh, July 15 coup attempt uh, is very, it was very important for me uh, it's uh, planned for the Erdogan regime. It's uh, used at least uh, by the uh, Erdogan. And the Erdogan regime needed an environment uh, where basic legal protections would be suspended. People would be arrested according to the profiling list and evidences should be constructed accordingly. And uh, they also needed an environment uh, where confessions under the torture could easily be taken and without fearing the legal uh, responsibility of the tortures. And uh, to put it another way, 
and uh, and in a normal uh, country with the minimum legal standard uh, it was impossible to do so so the master plan was based on a failed coup attempt and declaration of the state of emergency and where all the basic legal rules and safeguards of the torture were su suspended and detainees were routinely subjected to, to the torture and forced to sign the confessions then then were transmitted to judicial authorities to, for the legal proceedings. All the uh, proceedings and uh, the, uh, the uh, obtained from the torture and the, that type of confession, confessions. That's, that's the master plan. And so uh, what we have seen is not an individual uh, issue, it's the state organized uh, crime against humanity, unfortunately. It's not an individual uh, human rights uh, violations issue. And just let me give an example. And uh, after the coup attempt and uh, CPT and uh, Committee for the Prevention of the Torture was planning to go to Turkey to see the situation. And before before they go in there, and uh, uh, official document was uh, leaked to the media. And uh, the document was, was saying that uh, it was the confidential uh, and we had, we had, we have uh, it and uh, instructing to the all provinces of the uh, police to obscure the traces of the torture and in detention center and not to use the official detention centers. So, you know, the states or Erdogan regime is organizing the torture. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a part of the master plan because uh, there is no uh, evidence against the Gulen followers, illegal evidence. There is nothing uh, to prosecute uh, those people and only uh, option to, uh, to get the confession by way of torture and illegal activities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, that type of demonization has a cascading effect on the, uh, all societies, and uh, especially the, it's the case for judges and prosecutors and uh, police officers and prison guards. They, they don't see that uh, these people are, are uh, human. And uh, they, they act uh, as an enemy, uh, act uh, towards them as an enemy. And uh, this, this is the case, why uh, it's so dangerous, why that group is so vulnerable in Turkey now. Mm -hmm. So uh, also, uh, you know, uh, the religious sentiments and national uh, sentiments are also uh, exploited by the uh, Erdogan regime. So, and uh, today uh, the torturer ha has a motivation uh, when the torture people as they are as a kind of religious uh, uh, issue and they are acting uh, uh, religiously uh, a permissible thing uh, to torture the people. I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, the mindset uh, that the government is, is uh, giving that impression. Uh, you are doing the right thing and you are fighting against the infidels. You know, it's permissible to do that religiously. So it's very dangerous uh, too. So uh, another point, uh, maybe uh, as we have seen so far, uh, more than 5,000 judges and prosecutors have been uh, expelled and half of them were jailed and including the, uh, the high level judges and prosecutors. And then uh, it's not possible to uh, expect that the, the today's judge can deliver justice without fearing uh, the Erdogan regime's uh, uh, retribution. So uh, it's not possible. Uh, uh, a con uh, that a country and uh, one third of the judiciary has been dismissed and the rest of them cannot deliver any justice. 
as rightly it was rightly mentioned, um, a new uh, judge have been recruited by the government. These are not the judges. These are the poor government's agent, ag agents, and they are acting uh, according to uh, the uh, instructions given by the uh, Erdogan regime. And uh, in a big picture, uh, we have uh, witnessing a kind of organized uh, crime. And uh, it might be called as crime against humanity and, and persecution and uh, organized by the, uh, the Turkish government. And rule of the law uh, and is, is suspended. And all the basic uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, rules were reversed. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, today people uh, so far uh, six uh, thousands, uh, six hundred thousands uh, people have been arrested, and including judges and prosecutors, and uh, the basic basic uh, 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 rules were reversed, like the uh, presumption of innocence. As the, the prime minister uh, was saying that, and we will uh, put them into jail and they will prove their innocence. So uh, today's Turkey, and uh, you are uh, uh, the terrorist uh, till you, you, you will prove that you are inno innocent. So there is no uh, individuality of the crime and punishment and uh, people uh, can be uh, arrested uh, because of the family affiliation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no specific charge against a person and the blanket uh, accusations uh, were made, are made against the people. And also all the activities before the coup attempt uh, was uh, legal, I mean. Uh, Gulen movement supporters, uh, Gulen movement activities were legal, uh, and you know uh, the education uh, facilities and banks, uh, universities, uh, all kind of activities were uh, under the supervision of the uh, state. So these uh, were the legal activities. After the coup attempt, and uh, they all they were all closed, but. Uh, these activities were accepted uh, as illegal activities. And you can't do that because uh, the, the basic principle of the non-retroactivity of the crimes uh, exists. You can't uh, go back uh, to, the, uh, to uh, uh, before, uh, you, you can't do that. I mean, uh, the act uh, uh, during that time was totally legal. And after that, you can uh, ban it, you can uh, uh, consider it a crime, but you can retroactively apply that uh, situation. The basic uh, uh, element is this. I mean, uh, the, uh, there is no single case uh, that those people have um, violence uh, activity. There is uh, any single, there is no one single case that uh, that, that all of those activities contain the violence. Uh, these are the peaceful people. There is no criminal record for them, but uh, unfortunately, and uh, the Erdogan regime is, is, as you are right, the, the participants mentioned, uh, releasing the real da dangerous people uh, and the criminals and keeping that peaceful uh, people inside. And uh, lastly, uh, the, in a big picture, uh, what Turkish government and Erdogan regime is doing is the mass uh, uh, arrestation and uh, arbitrary detention against the international law, with, which uh, may constitute as a crime against humanity. And uh, it, it was also determined by the United Nations Working Group of Arbitrary Detention and the Human Rights Committee. And it was 
uh, underlined by those uh, courts and bodies that Turkey is abusing that system and it cost, might constitute a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, torture, organized torture, unfortunately rape and rape threat towards the, especially the women and uh, the vulnerables. And also uh, abduction, uh, systematic abduction from the outside uh, abroad and uh, in Turkey. This is also uh, the pattern. And also uh, as a result of the torture and retreatment and more than 100 case, the people uh, we, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the it, it's um, uh, framed as a suicide by the government, but we know that these people are uh, um, lost their lives as a consequence of the torture and ill treatment. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, situation is very, very uh, dangerous uh, for the vulnerables and that group. Uh, no, international community should act, uh, intervene in the process and uh, knowing that there is no single institution uh, inside the Turkey to protect those uh, people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this information. And what you were saying about the release of the real criminal violence, violent criminals, uh, as soon as they were released, I remember some news on Twitter because we can see the news on just Twitter, you know, and there were criminals, they were just released and bent on rape or, you know, murder or other violent acts while all the political prisoners are still, you know, kept in bars. It's really iron against sad. And it was a very, it's been a very productive, informative session for me. And I'm online panel. Thank you for your contribution. I would like to ask your closing remarks. Maybe you want to call on individuals, human rights organizations, decision makers. I don't know. Let's start with again, Katrina for the closing remarks. Well, this has been a sobering uh, panel discussion, and I want to thank all my fellow panelists for their insights. And um, we are witnessing a very tragic situation in Turkey, and it's tragic at the very personal level, the suffering and the abuse and the violation of rights for these tens of thousands. I mean, it's into the 30, 40,000 innocent people who have been um, caught up in this vendetta of Erdogan against the peaceful Gulen movement and against others, journalists, political opposition figures, human rights defenders whom he perceives as a threat to his regime. But in addition to the personal tragedy, which is always first and foremost, I think at a human level in our hearts and minds, there is the, the society-wide tragedy that, um, as was just said, uh, we see all of the basic pillars of a stable, democratic, and pluralistic government, the rule of law, a free press, the presumption of innocence, um, the upholding of basic international standards of human rights and uh, treatment of, of prisoners and legal protections, for the whole society of Turkey, these basic pillars, which are the only things that can sustain a decent society, are being chipped away at, are being really having a, a hammer taken to them. And over time, and I, I thank um, uh, Talib for his comments, when all of these tools and mechanisms of government are uh, corrupted in this way, um, the population itself begins to buy into this narrative of demonization and otherizing and justifying um, these abuses and these attacks. And so really, um, we have to recognize that there is only so much capacity for the brave people within Turkey themselves to fight back against this. And without much more outspoken 
and much more concrete and much more aggressive action by the international community, led by the United States, led by the EU, and of course the United Nations. Um, people within Turkey cannot do this by themselves. I mentioned in my opening remarks that sort of the glimmer of hope to me that democracy is not entirely crushed in Turkey were the results of the mayoral election in Istanbul. And that is an incredibly important first step. But the bottom line is through the first the state of emergency and then the new presidential sort of authoritarian system that has weakened the other independent sources of power in Turkey, um, the, the system itself in Turkey is not able to function as it should. It simply isn't. When you have no free press, when you have no rule of law, when you have the corruption of the judicial system, when you have, um, in effect, Turkey still being forced to operate under um, state of emergency measures. Theoretically, the state of emergency has lapsed, but the reality is that that's still how the Turkish government is functioning. Mm -hmm. And so chief among all the other nations of the world, the United States needs to use its relationship with Turkey. And always you want to use a combination of carrots and sticks. You know, we don't want to cut off relations with Turkey. We don't want to cut off um, sort of um, um, vehicles of communication and cooperation and collaboration. We can't do that. We can't afford to do that. Turkey is a very important country, but there have to be sticks too. I mentioned at the outset, the importance of things like global Magnitsky sanctions. This is a way not only of really hurting the bad actors where it counts, you know, in their pocketbooks, in their ability to travel to the West, to travel to Europe, to travel to the United States, to, you know, send their kids to the best universities in the United States or in England or wherever. So we need to, to target those individuals and we need to be fearless in putting people on that Magnitsky sanction list. But it also holds them up to shame and condemnation within Turkey. And it will cause people within Turkey to say, why are these prominent figures in our government being sanctioned by the American government, being sanctioned by the EU? Many countries within the EU are developing their own Magnitsky sanctions. Um, and, uh, and that's a concrete thing, you know, that goes beyond rhetoric and beyond a resolution of condemnation or beyond calling upon, you know, Turkey to do this or that. That hurts the abusers where it counts. And when we begin to hurt the human rights abusers, hurt the offenders um, in their pocketbooks, in their ability to travel and in their national and international reputation, nobody wants to be on that Magnitsky sanctions list because that is um, sort of a, a badge of shame. And we need to be more aggressive in using this tool. It's a powerful tool. It's a tool that was adopted after the basically murder by the state in Russia of a, of a lawyer, a young lawyer who uncovered corruption within the Russian government. And then he was falsely charged with committing the crimes he had uncovered and he was beaten in prison not given medical attention, which certainly relates to our discussion about the COVID situation mm -hmm. in Turkey's prisons and left to die. Mm -hmm. And his former employer did, dedicated his life to achieving justice for this young lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. And now the whole world knows that when somebody has Magnitsky sanctions put against them, it means they're one of the bad guys. They're one of the, the abusers. And that I think is a tool that exists now. We don't need to pass a new law. We just need to use it. We need to shine the harsh light of, um, of exposure on um, those within the Turkish government who are complicit in these outrageous human rights abuses. Slap Magnitsky sanctions on them and, uh, and they will howl and they will scream and they will protest, but they will be publicly shamed. They will be sanctioned. It, they'll be hit in the pocketbook They'll be hit in their ability to travel and their family's ability to travel. And it's something concrete we can do and we should do it and we must. Yeah, thank you so much. So naming and shaming the perpetrators is a very is vital in terms of taking concrete action. We want yes. to collaborate as, as ASD. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Joyce, 
Yes, well, naming and shaming is what you can do through the media, through, 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 and that is open for us mm -hmm. to use in this country to get the word out, to also make sure legislators know. Unfortunately, I'm just not optimistic that we will do everything we can in this country to name and shame until we have, a, you know, an administration that takes this kind of thing seriously. That is something that I think those in this country have to work to do. But listen, the, the one message, I, two messages I want to give. One is to the Turkish leadership. The world is watching. This will not go un, unanswered. What you are doing now is going to have a terrible price to pay when we do have a responsive and uh, moral government once again in the United States. The second thing is to talk to directly to those people who are suffering, mm -hmm. to let them know also the world is watching. The world, the people on the outside have not forgotten you. People on the outside are working for you. We are doing everything we can to call global attention to this and to make sure that your stories are being spread abroad so that people know you're not alone. There are people standing with you. So that's basically at the warning to the Turkish government that this is not going to go unchecked. What you are doing, you will have to pay for it eventually. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. Joyce, I mean, encouraging people, the perse per perse persecuted people to talk about, to speak up, it's very important. Thank you so much for this message. Okay. Iran, what's your remark? I just want to say, I think all of what, I, all, all of the things that you all said, um, all the other panelists, um, I do think that just to review, I am a journalist and I've been a journalist for over two decades which is why I formed the coalition because I, as a journalist, saw that I can't do my job and I saw my colleagues were not able to do our job. So we started doing this work precisely because we're seeing that press is being stifled around the world and countries like Turkey are exemplary in that silencing. So the one thing that I think we can work on still in countries, that like, countries like Turkey that, that say that they're democratic is to bring the parliamentarians and politicians on the board with us, the opposition of such governments on board with us to uh, you know, propagate you know, press freedom and to fight for you know, these democratic values of a democracy. And I think that's really somewhere we have not looked into. I think politicians and parliamentarians and opposition themselves are also under the same pressure. Right, we are all going through the same thing, which is stifling by these kind of uh, governments. So I think that it is key that we bring people who are in the parliament in a democratic country, who are instruments of a democratic country, to to join us in this cause. Yeah. So mobilization of opposition plays a very important role, right? Lobbying, mobilization, collaboration. That's right. I know it's a, it's a very it's not a very it's a, it's a very contested idea in journalism, as you know, that journalism is objective. I think that in journalism, we have come to a point where uh, press freedom is, is challenged and that is not letting us do our job anywhere as what's happening in the United States. I mean, you know, it's, it's really, it really is, it's surprising in a way because we always have thought that in countries like Iraq and Turkey and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Mexico, all kinds of press freedom issues we've seen around the world, we would always look at the United States for democratic values, for lobbying, for, you know, asylum seekers would go, human rights defenders and journalists, when they wanted asylum, they would go to the US or, you know, Western mm -hmm. countries. And we're seeing this happening everywhere. So I think that it's the job of, of those people who are still in society who believe in democracy and who are part of democratic institutions, which includes parliamentarians, especially because they still have power to, to come on board and, and collaborate with um, human rights defenders and journalists. Absolutely, this collaboration is very important and I really appreciate, we are very grateful to, you know, Lantus Foundation, World Affairs Council and the Coalition of Women in Journalism. You have been collaborating and, you know, keeping solidarity with us. Thank you so much for all the efforts that you've been doing. And Mr. Aydin, for your closing remarks. Just a conclusion. Uh, you know, uh, the 
the structural problems exist uh, in Turkey. It's, uh, as I said, the state organized human rights violations are happening. So this issue is important. International community should see that uh, dimension of the uh, case and act accordingly, especially United Nations are acting, uh, is acting uh, more objectively and uh, uh, some remedies uh, available for, uh, for for Turkey. But when it comes to European uh, Council, especially uh, European Court of the Human Rights, mm -hmm. there is a problem over there. Uh, we don't know what kind of bargaining or situation are happening between the Erdogan regime and European Council, but they, they are closing uh, their uh, uh, eyes uh, to the Turkey and insisting that uh, the domestic remedies should be uh, used before coming. This is a total shame for that type of uh, institutions. It's unacceptable. I'm calling uh, uh, that uh, uh, European Council to act according to their uh, mandate, their duties like the United uh, Na Nations. So yeah, we can encourage uh, people who have been persecuted to submit their cases to United Nations. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, sorry, there, there will be a, a misunderstanding. I'm also uh, suggesting to go to European Court of the Human Rights. Do, uh, don't give up and insist, uh, go to European Court of the Human Rights, but, but uh, 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 in a big picture, uh, they, they are somehow uh, evading to, to handle the issue. Uh, uh, that's the problematic, very much problematic. It's of all the ways that we can find answers, you're right. It yeah. has been a very informative and productive meeting. Thank you again in, from the perspective of judiciary and journalism, which is very important in human rights issues. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to us. I'm thanking the audience. Okay. And hoping to collaborate in much more projects. Have a Thank great you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for organizing this important panel and for the very important work of Advocates for Silence Turkey. Um, because of you, they aren't, they may be silenced in Turkey, but their voices are heard elsewhere. So we really Absolutely. admire your work. It's critically important and the world cannot turn away from Turkey and what's going on there. It's too important to the lives of all those who are suffering and Turkey can be and really must be important to the world. Um, you know, you talked ab about what a wonderful country it is and, and we all know that and we want Turkey to, to once again uh, be what it is meant to be. So thank you for, for organizing this. Stay strong, stay strong. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.